Good morning. I'm Anthony Berkeley, director of ACT, the investment team at the FII Institute. Your Excellency, Royal Highness, and esteemed delegates, please let's welcome Youssef Gamel Eldin, anchor for Bloomberg TV and moderator for our first session. Thank you very much. Sabal khair, ashab and ma'ali wa sa'ala. Ladies and gentlemen, it's fantastic to be here on stage back in Riyadh. It's been way, way too long. We've got a very important conversation to be had. Spend a lot of time with the data, with the charts. Look at CO2 emissions globally in 2020, 31.5 gigatons. That's down what? That's roughly 5.4% lower than in the previous year. It's an encouraging step. But what the kingdom has done in terms of pushing CCE, the circular carbon economy, in terms of getting a G20 consensus, and for us to engage with stakeholders and see how we can take this, flesh it out, and push it forward. That's what we are here to do today. Let me introduce you to our panel this morning. We're joined by His Royal Highness, the Prince Abdul Aziz bin Salman bin Al Saud, the Minister of Energy for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Let me introduce you to uh, the remainder of our panel. We're joined by Matthew Harris, the founding partner at Global Infrastructure Partners. Jennifer Holmgren, CEO at Lanza Tech. Lorenzo Simonelli, Chairman and CEO at Big Fuse. William Winters, Group CEO at Standard Chartered Bank. Thank you. Oh, well, will you look at that? Apologies. And of course, we're joined by uh, Henrik Anderson from Vestas. He's the Group CEO and President, Vestas Wind Systems. Thank you very much. See, that's, that's the issue when you have a packed panel. <laughs> uh, things kind of, you know get mixed up a little bit. Uh, Minister, I, I'd like to start with you uh, with some opening remarks that you've prepared. Just commenting on the packed panel. It's quality, not quantity, that counts. Go ahead. Exactly. What was your question? My, so my understanding is, what I've been told, is that uh, you jotted down some ideas that you wanted to share at the very beginning before we get into the actual panel discussion. Uh, if there's been a change of plan, you know, we can go straight into the discussion. No, no, it's go ahead to this discussion. Uh, I have a very wonderful chart, just one chart to showcase how much uh, work we've been doing, <coughs> how honest we've been and continue to be in pursuing what we have put together, uh, announced by the Crown, the Crown Prince Mohammed be it on the <coughs> Green Initiative or the Middle East Initiative. Uh, but I will present it as we move on. Okay. So let's, uh, let's get into that then. And, and since the Kingdom played such an important role in, in 2020 uh, in terms of crafting the circular carbon economy agenda, uh, just run me through what the top policy priority is for you now as you begin this new chapter. Well, we've been always and consistently saying um, there are three main pillars. I think any person who has been involved in energy would recognize them. First, energy security, energy security, and energy security. I think it's the most fundamental pillar when coming to, when talking about energy, uh, energy per se. Uh, the fundamental or 
other pillar is economic prosperity, economic growth, and the well-being of people at all levels. And now the most daunting uh, challenge that we are all faced with is climate change. And I, we honestly believe that these two pillars have to be attended to without uh, in any way whatsoever compromising mm -hmm. any of the three. None of them should come at the cost or the compromise of the three of these two other mm -hmm. pillars. So the, the ch most challenging thing for us, and I must say the whole world, mm -hmm. is how can we attend to these three uh, pillars uh, without circumventing any of, the, of those three pillars. In doing so, uh, we came up in this room, November 2019, I was at that part of the stage announcing our initiation of uh, working on the circular carbon economy. Uh, with COVID and with all the atrocity that we all went through, we kept uh, online and now we, have, we are up running, executing what we believe in. More important, I think we were successful in ensuring that the whole world uh, in the embodiment of the G20 to approve the, G the CCE as a way forward for having to uh, achieve these three pillars. So I'll leave it there and yeah. could. Matt, let's get to you. I mean, uh, you run a firm that has about <coughs> $54 billion in assets. So it would be interesting for our global audience this morning to kind of get a private investor perspective on advancing some policies towards CCE. And so you know, we, we, we run funds that invest across all uh, parts of the infrastructure value chain, all of which are critical to you know the uh, the enabling of this circular carbon economy and the the transition into a new age of energy. It, it, it is going to take a collective effort between government, corporates, and private in, uh, capital to pull this off. Um, if we look at the advancement of renewable energy over the last 25 or 30 years, you'll see a good example of how the three constituents can work together to make all of this a reality. It's not going to be a straight line. It's going to have bumps, as we've seen recently in Europe, but it can happen. In renewable energy, we had early investment. We had policies put in place to support uh, through feed-in tariffs, through uh, ITCs and PTCs, over time the industry innovated, it grew to scale. I think when you think about a lot of these markets, people need to understand that while hydrogen is, a, is, is, is great potential, it's not a market today. And the investment that is required to create markets takes many, many years. Uh, we saw that happen in renewable energy. It can happen in other markets with the right support. We, we need support, we need transparency. Ideally, what I'd like to see is a global price on carbon so that we can easily cost in uh, the, the price of decarbonization. The markets are going to do that anyway, mm -hmm. and to the extent we can bring that to bear, that transparency, it'll make the transition even easier. Yeah. Jennifer, let me get you to weigh in on <coughs> this as well. You've been at the forefront in terms of tech, and we'll talk a bit more about the tech in a bit, mm -hmm. but just run me through how you approach uh, the ambition of CCE. Yeah. So fundamentally, we approach it at the very fundamental carbon level. We think about recycling carbon itself, and um, whether it be carbon emissions or whether it be solid carbon, we imagine a future where we're refining CO2 to make the products we need in our daily lives. Um, okay. Yeah, and. Uh, and we'll get back to, back in a minute around, because around, I want to flesh out some of the tech. But before we, we get to that, I want to get to just the, the broader policy point on circular carbon economy. Um, Lorenzo, uh, in terms of what you've seen, um, 
what exactly are, are the series of steps that need to be done to kind of build on what the minister just, just laid out in terms of the framework? Well, first of all, it's uh, great to be back in uh, Riyadh and my compliments to the organizers and also great to be with the minister again. I think uh, what we're seeing here with the Green Initiative is really the pillars that are required for CC to be successful. It starts with a regulatory framework. It starts with a common understanding of how we're going to adopt policy. And then also it comes into promoting the right financing, the right stimulus for the recycling of carbon and the carbon economy to be circular. And you then need the collaboration. And that collaboration needs to be both from a private public perspective. If you start to put these three elements in place, then you're going to actually create the demand and it be successful. So we really look at it from those three pillars of uh, foundation to drive forward. Henrik, can I get you to weigh in as well on, uh, on some of the initiatives and uh, what you're seeing from Avesta's point of view? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, your Royal Highness and your Minister. It's, it's a pleasure. There wouldn't be a place I would rather be than here today. And why is that? Um, in, in many ways, we have now seen technology helping us along and picking up on Matt's point. When we look for the climate, we look for the next generation and how we pass on this. Uh, wind is a good example. Uh, wind was 12 gigawatt in 2000. It was 185 gigawatt in 2010. And it was 770 gigawatt in 2020. In just a few months from now, we will inaugurate one of the largest uh, wind parks in, in the kingdom. Um, in, and we are, we are very proud of that, been working closely with the kingdom. But that started in 2013. And as a reflection of that, as we are saying, you have to move both the competence, the people and the technology where we can also make the biggest step. Um, so we are moving our regional office to uh, the kingdom. Uh, we are also here to see that the technology will help us along. And today, that technology <coughs> is very important that it can scale hand in hand in this energy transition. What we see in the world, which I'm, I have to say I'm scared personally of right now, is that we see a lot of stop and go every second year. And it's the stop and go that probably prevents the society, both <coughs> from a public, the private world, to really stick together. Uh, so it's the ongoing effort. To give you that, we are the world's largest wind turbine maker. We have now put more than 70,000 turbines up globally. Mm -hmm. But that park of turbines globally replaces 220 million tons of CO2 every year. Yeah. And, and, and that has to be a priority when we look ahead. Because hydrogen, absolutely, it will require more green renewable energy. So that's the vision, yeah. and as you can probably hear, it's also the passion of Vestas. Uh, Bill, uh, in terms of the role of big lenders uh, like Standard Chartered, um, they've got a big role to play, to say the least. And net zero is not just about setting lofty goals, it's about creating new product lines and really innovating. Run me through how you see the role of Standard Chartered kind of in this journey. Yeah, first of all, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I've enjoyed the comments of the panel already. I think it's made clear some of the challenges that we have. Uh, all of these transitions cost money. Uh, we've all heard the numbers, so we've heard them just in the last uh, day again. Three and a half, four and a half trillion dollars per annum of, of funding required to affect this transition to net zero. Uh, and we also know that that, that funding needs to be very front-loaded uh, if we're going to hit the, the 2030 objectives on the pathway to 2050 net zero. Uh, so that, when we look at that three and a half, four and a half, some will say five trillion dollars per annum, uh, we can look in the developed countries and see we've got a pretty good idea where 60 or 70 percent of that finance is likely to come from. When we look in the developing countries, uh, which is a material contributor to, to the, the emissions of the world, uh, we can only see uh, something like 20 to 30 percent of the financing available. And if you go to something like Sub-Saharan Africa, it's less than 10 percent of the financing is available. And that's a huge gap to close. Now, at the same time, we know that, that Matt and, and others have set up funds that are dedicated to this sort of activity. Uh, but the connection point between the, uh, the, the funding that exists, ESG funding, uh, trillions of dollars uh, dedicated, and the ability to get that into the hands of people that, that can actually affect these projects, big, big disconnect. And I think for finance broadly, uh, banks specifically, and Standard Chartered Bank, 
very specifically, given our uh, very substantial operations in the Middle East, uh, Africa, uh, and then through Asia, uh, connecting the, the, the finance to the, the, the underlying technology is, is our key role. Uh, and that will require a uh, focus on, on technical skills, understanding the project-related risk in these cases, uh, a focus on sources of capital. So a, a lot of, we know that a lot of this capital is going to have to come through private-public part, private partnerships. Uh, so World Bank and, uh, and IFC and, and AIIB and others working together with, uh, with pure private sector. Priorities, and, and you talked a little bit about that. I'm wondering, uh, we're counting down to, to COP26, and there are a lot of questions about partnerships and, and global cooperation. And we had a series of meetings this week, of course, or at least the kingdom has had with some of its peers in the region. How would you like to, to push that forward? Uh, and and where, do, where, where do you see that going in terms of consensus? Well, we, we honestly don't mind being uh, the, we were the first to talk about it. And uh, we don't mind being the first to execute it. In fact, if I could have that chart that I've been promising you show you, here you go. This is what we call it our energy house or castle, dependent on how modest you are. But this is where we have, this is our ecosystem. This is our energy strategy. We are even talking about carbon, hydrogen. We're doing all of the above. We're going to make sure our friends from Standard Chart are talking about financing. This is the whole ecosystem. This is the enablers. Not, of course, lined up on order. But this is it. And we've got knife. And we have, uh, we'll be issuing our own energy strategy very soon, which is an embodiment of, of, of this. And the Green Initiative and the Middle East Initiative, if you look at all of these uh, initiatives that were, uh, or programs that were announced, it all goes around this whole thing. It's about remove, efficiency, um, changing to uh, producing hydrogen, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, uh, reduce efficiency, going through hi hydrogen, going through renewable, reuse, again, you will see there, recycling, because of the limitation of time, mm -hmm. and even remove, not within, some of it is within our scope as energy ministry, which is carbon sequesterization and what have you, but there is also the other part with the Ministry of Environment when it comes to greening, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, attending to, uh, to, to, to the many activities that were initiated there. I think it, we are also putting our money where our mouths are. In some of these initiatives, we are recommending uh, funding schemes, such which is, is the more important one, which is the CCE funding program. It's a 10, we're suggesting it, it could be a $10 billion program for 10 years. We're gonna be footing 15% uh, of that. Uh, we have, I think, the most humane initiative that we could ever come up with, and we're willing to enlarge it if everybody wants to enlarge it, which is getting rid of, it's two on one. Yeah. The idea of creating a fund whereby we will try to help mitigate this awesome, inhumane uh, issue of having people to use biomass to get to cook their food is a human tragedy. Yeah. And it really tells you a lot about how, how, how condescending this world has become. There are people who are talking about sniffing the little particles here and there. 
and they're not concerned about two billion people. They cannot afford nor have the mean or the accessibility to clean fuel. If we can put that together, and we are suggesting yeah. a 750, a 500 million dollar program, that will take care of about 750 million people. This is like a, a microfinancing scheme where this pledges can come in, and other lending agencies and institutions can come. The whole thing will be two billion, yeah. two billion, two billion dollars will help enable 700. 50 million people of having an access to cleaner cooking fuels. It would help in mitigating a serious health issue for those people. In fact, it gets into the dying, people dying for that, but more also in terms of emission reduction. This is just one out of so many, and I would urge everybody to go and read this uh, Green and Middle East initiative. So, Moulin Amir, just so we can get some others to weigh in on some of the important points that you just laid out. And I also want to get to the technology. Uh, Jennifer, you have invented, or your company has <coughs> invented, a commercial scale bioreactor. It kind of feeds off greenhouse gases uh, to a species of anaerobic bacteria, if I got this right. This is yeah. a, a lot of. Uh, <laughs> A lot of complex chemistry involved, far beyond uh, any of my knowledge, but uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about it, that. Yes, so um, what we do is we have a bacteria that ferments gases, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and converts them to ethanol. These gases would come from a steel mill, uh, refinery, chemical plant, or solid waste, like municipal solid waste. We convert that to ethanol, and we think of ethanol as a feedstock. A feedstock, because once you've made ethylene, you can make everything we use in our daily lives. We've made also aviation fuel, and so we think of ethanol as a way to aggregate all these waste resources that can't be moved, because they're inhomogeneous. So that's, that's what we've been doing. It sounds like science fiction, it's not science fiction. We have two commercially operating plants in China, one at a steel mill, one at a ferroalloy plant. And to show that we can make products from that, we have flown a flight from Orlando to Gatwick using the sustainable aviation fuel we made from this recycled carbon ethanol. Unilever sells a detergent that has a surfactant made from our recycled carbon ethanol. Lululemon has made fiber. So you can start to see the ability to take waste resources, including CO2, and refine them into the products we need. And that's what we do. We do it with biology. Fantastic. Uh, we'll talk about the scalability sure. uh, in a bit. Uh, I was reading through a BNF report, and one of the things that stood out to me is their conclusion that basically, despite the flurry of new commitments that you've seen towards net zero, most net zero targets are firmly classified as low impact, low ambition. Something to bear in mind as we try and flesh out uh, some of these goals that have been laid out. Uh, I want to get to Matt again, just in terms of getting a private investor perspective. Uh, Matt, uh, as you look towards sustainability, what are some of the processes and uh, technologies that you're looking at? So we're, we're, by the way, I want to thank His Royal Highness for that, for that chart. It was incredible. I'd, I'd actually like to borrow it for some of my investors. It, it, it do you know, really, do you know, really lays out everything. Do you know who did it? Most of them are girls and boys, girls and, well, women and men under the age of 30. Yeah, it's really, it's really well laid out. Yeah. Um, so when we, when we think about process and, and, uh, and technology, we think about it in two ways. For, first of all, what, what in existing businesses today can be repurposed? There's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that's in the ground today that can be used uh, to enable the circular carbon economy. We've got gathering lines and pipelines. Well, those carry oil and gas today. There's no reason they can't carry hydrogen in the future. We, we can repurpose those for carbon capture. We can use those to move carbon and store carbon. 
We could move uh, carbon in those to facilities that Jennifer is going to build. Um, there's a huge opportunity in the embedded infrastructure. One of the things that we've done in the region is work with companies like Aramco and Adnoc to take existing infrastructure, monetize that, use those proceeds to reinvest into this circular carbon economy, into new technologies and new areas. We also look very closely at investing in new markets. What we want to see as an infrastructure investor is, is the technology proven? And if it's proven, then we can invest at scale in the infrastructure that will enable it. I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that's really critical here to uh, investing in all these initiatives is scale. When you think about the hydrogen and the hydrogen market, potential of hydrogen, hydrogen today is produced with electrolyzers that are you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 gigawatts. We need 500 uh, uh, megawatts, uh, I said gigawatts and megawatts, we need 500 megawatts, gigawatt, gigawatt size electrolyzers. Well, that's not a market today. The supply chain, the, the, the scale, the employee base, all of that has to be created. And that's where private capital can come in to enable these processes mm -hmm. to take hold. Uh, Bill, I want to get to you again uh, in terms of what you see around the carbon markets. Uh, you've been a big proponent of that. Standard Chartered has been, uh, well, you've been on the task force specifically. Just to give us a bit of an overview of uh, where that process is at and what would you like to see in, in, you know, develop over the next uh, six months? Yeah, you know, the, the, the voluntary carbon markets or carbon markets generally have been around for quite a while. I, mean, I, I was very involved 20, 20 years ago in the early stages of the voluntary carbon markets. Unfortunately, uh, the market never fully scaled and, uh, and is lacking credibility. It, was, it lacked credibility because there were no consistent standards uh, for what's a good project, what's a good project that actually gets carbon out of the environment or, or prevents it from going in the first place. Uh, so we kicked off an initiative uh, about a year and a half ago to say you know, that the power of private markets can be phenomenally contributive to this, to this challenge, right? The, the, the private capital that, that Matt and, and others are bringing to bear, uh, Standard Chartered, can make a huge difference here. In fact, without the private markets fully co-opted into this process, we can't possibly get there. Uh, so we, uh, we set about setting a minimum level of standards for what is a good project, what's a qualifying carbon, uh, carbon credit project. Uh, we, set a, a, with, with, we had a, a task force with 250 members, 400 individuals, representing the, the full carbon community. So buyers of credit, so originators of projects, uh, buyers being the, the polluters, uh, intermediaries, banks, brokers, academics, the NGO community, very heavily involved. And we said we set ourselves the, the, the challenge of having a very high quality set of standards that was, were really indisputable. And we, we made some very clear recommendations in that regard. We also put a governance structure around that. So having a board of directors that's made up of, of uh, overwhelmingly independent, i.e. academics and NGOs, uh, who are, uh, will able to be able to curate those, those core carbon principles uh, so that we can have confidence if you buy or sell a credit that it's a good one and, and it can be used as a legitimate claim uh, on your pathway to net zero. Uh, so we released our detailed reports in July. We stood up, stood up the board of directors uh, last month uh, that it's now operating. They're finalizing the, the, the set of standards and uh, I think the objective now is to, to put this into action. So one of the things that Standard Charter did is, is uh, join, with, join forces with, with partners in Singapore to set up something called the Climate Impact X which is a marketplace and exchange for these high quality carbon credits. And uh, we're collecting projects from uh, around the world, putting them uh, out for, for, uh, for auction. We actually completed the first auction last week. Uh, and the, the thing that really differentiates this is that you know for certainty that these projects have been curated to be very high quality. What's the objective? The objective is to get to the point where we can move literally hundreds of billions of dollars per year from the pockets of people like Standard Chartered Bank who have a a pathway to net zero into the pockets of people that can actually get the carbon out of the environment. And whether that's Jennifer or Matt uh, or any of the others here or any of you uh, who are looking to make these, these contributions to a net zero economy, but using things that, that wouldn't be economic otherwise. Uh, the need is hundreds of billions a year. Without a market to facilitate that transfer from the private sector into the, the hands of people that can actually get the carbon out of the environment, we won't get there. Final comment. If we do this properly, we'll have a price for carbon. 
and every corporate planner can look at that price for carbon and say, that's the hurdle uh, that I need to pass in order to justify the investments I need to make. And if we're successful, mm -hmm. the price for carbon will be quite high. Uh, and therefore, the, 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 the effective uh, hurdle for ongoing emissions will be quite low. And we'll all be focused on doing what's most important, which is reducing our existing emissions. What caught my eye as well while I was uh, doing some of the research for the panel is that if you look at the net zero target for a company like Glencore, the amount that gets cut from that is equivalent to the emissions of Italy, which is why it's, it's so absolutely pivotal that we flesh out some of the goals and secure some of those commitments. Lorenzo, could I get you to weigh in on this as well in terms of the technology? Yeah, we at Baker Hughes made a commitment of net zero in 2019, and uh, we said net zero by 2050 and 50% reduction by 2030. And actually, as you look at it, there's really uh, three levels that are available to us. And there's the transform the core, which is technologies that are available today. And I can't stress enough how much we can already do with what's available. Uh, in the kingdom today, we're already deploying Flare IQ, which reduces the methane that's emitted from Flare stacks. We're uh, deploying CCUS. We're working very closely with APQ on the NEON project, as well as Aramco. And these are technologies that are available today, as well as equipment upgrades that reduce the carbon footprint. Then you go into Invest for Growth, which is really the area of new technologies such as hydrogen and what's happening with Jafura and also what's been committed by the kingdom on hydrogen. We know how to utilize hydrogen and we also know how to make green hydrogen. It's not from a technical perspective that complicated, but you need the regulatory, you need the financial governance and infrastructure in place, which is what we see happening here in the kingdom. And then you get to the new frontiers, and that's where a lot of the technology of what's required from a biology perspective, it's further out there, but we've got to start looking at it from a standpoint of near term, medium term, longer term, and the journey, and actually stop some of the short termism and look more towards creating an ecosystem that enables that. And as a technology provider, we know that we can provide the technology and we can actually create that ecosystem, but it requires partners and collaboration, which I'm pleased to say we're seeing in the kingdom. Henrik, we'll get to you in a minute, but the, the minister would like to respond briefly. Uh, just about uh, talking about markets. Uh, with the win uh, issue, I'm just wondering about it because uh, what international markets would do, carbon market, uh, would be somewhat uh, disturbing the notion of equality because you are going to be uh, asking a developing country uh, executing uh, a development project paying for a, a carpet footprint for someone else who had been proceeding for 200 years uh, building up all those stacks and stack of carbon and I just wonder how this uh, could happen at the cost of a, a very poor country or just about to evolve in terms of development. So this is, again, uh, I can see it correctly working with the countries which are on the so-called Annex 1 countries on those who are part of the Paris Agreement. But certainly, as part of the Paris Agreement, uh, we didn't agree to that. We agreed to a south-to-south -to -south type of arrangements, and we've agreed to a domesticated exchanges, or even we call them, we didn't call them market, we call them offsets programs. So what we want to initiate as Saudi Arabia is somewhat more egalitarian, at least the same situation, but certainly you cannot compromise a country, you name it, Kenya, Nigeria, and you put it in the rank and file of Sweden or Denmark, both countries will pay for the same equal uh, price for carbon. I'm just trying to flag that, that it's, it, it's in the notion of fairness. It cannot be done uh, because that will cripple these uh, potential country, the potential of these countries' growth. Henrik, technologies 
uh, I know Vesta is doing a lot of uh, a lot of fascinating stuff. So why don't you run us through it? <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I was just inspired, uh, Your Highness, because when you said Kenya, it's interesting uh, that uh, some five years ago we put up a relatively large wind farm in Kenya. Uh, we had to build new roads, approximately 250 kilometers, to get it built. Today it contributes with 15% of the electricity uh, demand in Kenya and therefore covers. And you just need to travel around in Kenya to see the next generation of young kids having access mm. to electricity in schooling and other stuff. Then you know what this is about. So I, I think here, when, when elaborating a little bit of that, I don't think that technology are sort of non-existing. They're here today. The technology are leaning towards also the hydrogen uh, we will then start discussing should hydrogen be manufactured, produced next to the assets. Um, and I will also say positively to uh, Matt and, and everyone else, the capital that's definitely available. And, and, the, and the projects out there today are too few compared to the capital that are seeking for investments. And if I look at that, every time we build, and we are one of the largest developers of uh, renewable energy solutions around the world. Every time we have a project, we have one very happy customer, and we typically have nine disappointed that says, why didn't you choose us in, in the development here? So I think right now, it's, the technology is here, and if I look the last 10 years, the technology of wind has dropped levelized cost of energy of the source with more than 60%. So actually, I, I'm really keen to also explore what you just said was the source of wisdom to your chart, uh, Minister, was the under 30. How do we engage that generation into continuing te technology? Because these guys, male, female, female, girls and boys, will be the one that owns that technology in their generation. And, and we are in a hurry. And, and let me just put that a little bit. I won't mention... <coughs> anyone, but at least say in Europe, when we have a target of going towards net zero, that target for renewable energy has now been increased even further away from what actually goes on. And working in a private company, I always find that a little interesting. When yeah. we are away for a target, we normally try to set what do we need to catch up with the target instead of moving the target along. And unfortunately, right now, what is in the planning in most parts, at least of Europe, means that we won't reach our targets until late in 2018, 90, maybe even in 2100. It's too late. So, so there is a real call for action if sure. we want to hit a 50% carbon reduction in 2030. It's here and now. Jennifer. Uh you were earlier talking about some of the technologies that you're working on. Uh, what about the scalability? Uh, what progress have you been able to make? What are you seeing? So, so in terms of scalability, I want to just tackle that in two ways. One is from what we're doing, you know, once you build the first one, the first commercial one, you can build more. And more importantly, once you've done it, you can also take it down the cost curve and the efficiency curve. So it gets much better to diffuse the technology. We're building plants right now also in India, in Belgium, um, in the US. So you can really see the technology proliferating. But if I sit in this room with so many investors, I, I need to talk a little bit about the first of a kind. Because getting from a world that is funded by venture capitalists to do the early stage work, to a world that's funded by the people sitting in this room that fund infrastructure. There is something we call the valley of death, okay? And it is very difficult to build a demonstration scale facility in the first commercial because there is enough uncertainty in the technology that the risk adjustment makes it very expensive and it's it's something that is very hard and i think if we really believe that we are at a moment in time where new technologies need to scale quickly then what we have to do is we have to head, get our heads together and figure out how to finance those two steps 
how do we make sure that new ideas can get to the first commercial so that they can then be deployed? And so I ask you to please consider how you come together to do that. And I know there's lots of new ideas. We finance Lanzajet with new ideas, but I, I would <coughs> urge you that there's more. Yeah. Bill, would you like to weigh in on that briefly and then also perhaps reflect on some of the cooperation and the sort of the international partnerships that are helping you advance sustainability? Yeah, I think Jennifer's point is, is, is an excellent one. And we all know how long it took, <coughs> and Henry could speak to it directly, how long it took to, to get wind or solar to the point of, from the point of technical viability to commercial viability. 15, 20, 25 years. We don't have 25 years to, to wait for these technologies. So what are the investments that we can make today that could significantly accelerate both the development of new technologies, but also the, the, the scaling of those technologies so that they're economically viable quickly without subsidy? I mean, Hendrik mentioned to me before that, that virtually nothing that he builds now is subsidized. And I know it's the same for solar. We've got to get to, to, the, to the same part for other new technologies. Now, how does that happen? I think one way is, is to, to take I mean, this carbon offset market that I talked about, I would love it if half of the $100 billion a year that gets invested goes into scaling technically viable but commercially non-viable for the time being technologies. And that's, but that infrastructure and that, that, that methodology doesn't exist today. To, to, for, for that, first of all, the market doesn't exist. We must create it. But the, the money's there. The companies that are, that are committing to, to, to get, go to net zero, they're going to reduce all they can and they're going to use offsets for the remainder. That's how you get to $100 billion per year. Let's just make sure that some of that goes into scaling these technologies. Uh, Lorenzo, uh, in terms of what Baker Hughes has been pushing for uh, around sustainability, and I, I mean, we keep saying uh, broad strokes, and what's really important, and many of you know this from watching me day to day, is, is I like to get to the meat of the matter and sort of get to the numbers and actual names, maybe with some anecdotes you can share around alliances, partnerships, cooperation, because uh, that's one of the important themes of today's panel. No, definitely, and I think um, also some of the comments made by the panel already, actually an evolution of the way in which we get to a circular carbon economy and also get to net zero. And we have three hard truths at Baker Hughes. Uh, the first being that, look, we've got to accelerate the pace. The second being hydrocarbons still play a role, and in particular natural gas, because as you move away from coal, natural gas is a clear winner, uh, especially for the developing world. And thirdly, it comes down to collaboration. Um, as I look at CCUS projects, you know, I can look at uh, the technology side, but I can also look at um, two years ago, we weren't talking about CCUS projects. Today in the kingdom, I'm already looking at three different projects and working hand in hand with Aramco and also Air Products, Aqua Power, with regards to developing the marketplace. When you think about uh, CCUS, then it's the ability to use carbon as well. And there is a use for carbon, and there's a use for CO2, and we can now liquefy CO2 into essentially a oil substance. And so carbon black becomes something that you can utilize and something that, again, can be provided as a product. So. As I look at collaborations, it really is key, but we need to move away from the theoretical and start having more examples. And, you know, I look at it as the run-up to COP26. Uh, you look at Northern Lights in Europe, you look at what's happening here in the kingdom. We really need to put the funding behind it, and it will scale. Yeah. Uh, we've seen it before. Uh, you look at solar, you look at wind, they scaled over 20 years, we need to do this in 10 years, and it's going to require all of us together actually working on it. Henrik? You didn't say I was slow, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> no, I'll, I'll just say here, one, one observation, and, I, and I, this is why I love being here. Everyone here as a kingdom thinks long term. The, these long term transitions are super important that we keep the eye on not making bold statements to withdraw certain energy sources like uh, nuclear or coal in the short term and then forget that the transition requires other assets to be put on because other actually we run the risk of having blackouts in local communities or local countries. So this is why I love the long-term thinking because this will be part of our way to think for the next many decades to come. And the build-out, the scalability, we have to do on technologies 
but at least I, from, on behalf of wind, the associated technology into hydrogen, absolutely, I can guarantee you. My dream is to be on stage here next year, to see that has been a technology center in this, this region as well, because we should be able to drive that, not only for the kingdom, but also for the region. So there's plenty of things to do. And, and I wish today, and I'm sorry that I should have brought a picture of, of our turbine uh, park in, in Dumat um, Al Janhal. Maybe we could be there uh, for a picture next year, yeah. or we will have maybe more wind parks next year, because that's really the testament of thinking long term. Mm -hmm. So thank you. But yeah, just just to, to, to you know some final words. I, I, I do think it's important to I, I don't think there's any issue that humanity has faced more complex than this one. Mm. The, the, the complexities associated with this transition and, and enabling this circular carbon economy are, are monumental. But I'm, I'm very optimistic, and I'm optimistic uh, even more so at gatherings like this. We bring together uh, government, we bring together corporations, and we bring together private capital. And the power that can be unleashed in that is, uh, is really phenomenal. We've talked a lot about renewable energy today. That is really a product of that partnership, that partnership between those three entities. And we have a huge advantage in that this base of cheap, clean energy exists. And everything we're talking about in terms of new technologies, for the most part, can use that cheap, clean energy. So we, we, we have a base that's established to take us forward. And I, 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 I think we can do it. Minister, some closing thoughts from you briefly uh, in terms of where you would like to see uh, COP26 kind of go. What, what message will you be carrying? I mean, of course, the, the, the run-up has already been quite clear, but maybe you can kind of sum it up uh, briefly for us. Well, uh, I'm sure that people had noticed that we have been repositioning ourselves and how we are coming out uh, how we are conducting ourselves, and how uh, we also will be helped and facilitated if we can get uh, Article, for example, 6 being up and moving on COP26. That will be a facilitator of markets uh, and exchanges and offsets. There are, we've been engaged uh, to the best of my ability and the team that I work with ability to come forth again with commitments and obligation that would not probably square well with the PR buzz and what have you, but <laughs> you rightly said, uh, when we make a commitment, we make a commitment. And we are a long-term people, and we will also want to be mindful of how the technology evolves. You know, CCE, first and foremost, depends on the evolution of technology. That's why we, when we came out with this uh, uh, statement about aiming to do 2060. It just luckily, we have, uh, as part of the Paris Agreement, uh, it allowed us to go for uh, a kind of a dynamic baseline, which enabled us to see how we fare with diversity, how we fare with technology, how we fare with how much we may lose in terms of revenue as a result of reduction of demand if it happens. I still argue it would not happen. But that dynamic base facilitate and, and enable us to, to move in both directions, dependent on That's why when we made that announcement of the 280 or 278, mm -hmm. it was the mean of, mm -hmm. of three different scenarios, 260, and with the usage, with the usage of this uh, base, uh, dynamic base scenario approach, it may actually, if technology evolve even faster, uh, it may not necessarily we'll have to wait until 260. It could bring it earlier. But more important, in all of these pledges, we're not seeking funding, we're not seeking grants, we're not going around the bushes you know, conditioning our 2060 about, uh, you know, something, mm -hmm. but you have to finance us by $15 billion per annum. None of that. We're not seeking nothing except global 
organized collaboration between the three uh, type of institutions that were recommended by our friends, yeah. putting together their heads together, working in technologies that will develop us, de deliver us. Again, I would have to emphasize energy security cannot be achieved by one source, two sources, or three sources. Right. CCE enables us to mitigate. If you want the whole world to congregate around mitigation, you can, yeah. by enabling them to say, we don't care about what source of energy you use. We care about what you do with how much you emit. Inclusivity can happen as a result of that. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, the end of the panel already, time's flown by. Uh, I could do this until next week, really, but we, ha we have to uh, put, a, put an end to this uh, for now. I'd like to thank uh, a, a fantastic panel, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, so the Minister of Energy. Uh, we had Henrik Anderson, the CEO and Group President of Vestas, uh, Jennifer Holmgren, CEO of Lanza Tech, Lorenzo Simonelli, Chairman and CEO of Big Hughes, William Winters, the Group CEO of Standard Chartered, Matthew Harris, the founding partner at Global Infrastructure Partners. Thank you for being such an amazing audience, patient and listening carefully, and I'm sure the conversations will continue far beyond the stage. Thanks again. By the way, Just in case if anybody would like to cop copy and paste, we'll make our chart available for everybody. <laughs>